Good morning, good evening to all of you. Welcome to the last webinar on 2021 organized by Euromune Academy. My name is Maite Sabalza and I am Scientific Affairs Manager at Euromune US. During 2021, the Euromune Academy hosted three webinar series on neurology, dermatology, and infectious diseases. Thank you all for joining these webinars and more to come in 2022. Today, the Euromune Academy is hosting the second episode of the Infectious Diseases Webinar on Emerging Tick-Bone Diseases, Powassan Virus. Similar to previous webinar, we have two speakers to present. Towards the end, we will also have a panel discussion. If you have any questions, please type them in the chat box on your screen, and we will relay them to the speakers during the panel discussion. Any unanswered questions will be addressed via email. And now, it is my pleasure to introduce to you our first speaker, Dr. Alexander Ciota. Dr. Ciota is the director of the Arbovirus Laboratory at Wadsworth Center, New York State Department of Health. Dr. Ciota's lab performs clinical testing, surveillance, and research on arboviruses. Dr. Ciota's primary research areas include arbovirus evolution, mosquito virus interactions, and the role of temperature in arbovirus transmission. Welcome, Dr. Ciota. I will pass it over to you to begin your presentation. Um, welcome, everybody. Again, my name is Alex Ciota. I'm the director of the Arbovirus Laboratory in New York State Department of Health. That's part of the, the Wadsworth Center. Um, and as you heard, we have a large research program um, studying vector virus and host interactions. Um, and we also do all the mosquito and tick surveillance testing uh, for New York State outside of New York City. And lastly, we do confirmatory uh, clinical testing for suspected arboviral infections, uh, specifically utilizing the plaque reduction neutralization test. So today I'll um, focused almost ex exclusively on Powassan virus, um, discussing uh, some of our research findings, our surveillance findings, and, and a little bit of clinical testing. And at the end of the talk, I'll um, mention a couple other emerging tick-borne viruses that um, are becoming uh, potentially more important in, in our region. Um, so Powassan virus is named after Powassan, Ontario, where it was first discovered in 1958. Um, it was isolated from the brain of a five-year-old child pictured here who um, unfortunately succumbed to, to viral encephalitis. Um, it's a positive sense RNA virus, flavivirus in the family flaviviridae, so it's a, a relatively close relative of uh, tick-borne encephalitis virus, a looping ill virus, um, and then on the mosquito side, West Nile virus, St. Louis encephalitis virus, um, Zika, dengue, um, yellow fever, and Japanese encephalitis virus. And like all these viruses, um, again, this is a single open reading frame um, with three structural and seven non-structural genes shown here that are both co- and post-translationally cleaved by viral and host proteases. So this is a neuroinvasive disease. It's vectored by ticks in the US, Canada, and Russia. And um, since the late 90s, we've, we've um, seen the emergence of two distinct lineages maintained in these separate enzootic cycles uh, pictured here. So uh, prototype Powassan lineage one and, and Powassan lineage two are deer tick virus. And I'll um, get more into the distinction between those two um, in later slides. So the incubation period um, is quite variable, about one to four weeks um, in between infection and symptom onset. Um, signs and symptoms initially are um, sort of generic febrile illness, fever, headache, vomiting, weakness, um, but this can often progress to neurologic involvement, and these are the cases that are um, most frequently diagnosed. And this can, can include meningitis, encephalitis, altered mental status, uh, seizures and aphasia. And importantly, this symptom presentation, um, particularly early on, may be very similar to other common tick-borne diseases, including those vectored by the same ticks, um, Lyme disease, um, anaplasmosis, and then others that share um, similar range to Powassan virus, um, Ehrlichia and, and Babesia. Um, so it's important um, to not just 
um, from a clinical perspective, look for Powassan virus, but also um, these other pathogens are co-infections with um, these other pathogens in Powassan virus. Um, general lab findings, um, lymphocytic, um, lymphocytic pleocytosis, so um, an increase in, in lymphocytes, um, particularly in the CSF, uh, neutrophils can predominate early, uh, normal to mildly elevated protein and normal glucose. Uh, the fatality rate is um, published to be around 10 to 15 percent for diagnosed cases. Um, of course, there's likely a number of subclinical cases that aren't diagnosed, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, but those individuals that do survive uh, frequently have long-term neurologic impairment. Um, and again, as I just said, little research has been done on asymptomatic or, or mild infection, and um, I'll show some data on this from, from New York State um, in a few slides. So in terms of the, the case definition for Poisson neuroinvasive infection, a fever over 38 degrees uh, with any peripheral or CNS dysfunction documented by a physician um, in the absence of another more likely explanation, um, as well as at least one of the following. So the most straightforward um, way to diagnose Powassan is isolation um, or detection of specific viral antigen or uh, nucleic acid RNA um, in tissue, blood, CSF, or another bodily fluid. Alternatively, a, a greater than fourfold rise in Powassan specific antibody titers in paired um, acute and convalescent serosamples, um, or Powassan specific IgM with a subsequent confirmatory neutralizing antibody test, and that's the test that we do in our lab um, in the same or later specimen. And importantly, that neutralizing antibody should be um, specific to Powassan, which means a, at least fourfold higher titer than corresponding antibody to other closely related uh, flaviviruses. Um, last, um, the last criteria or possibility for um, diagnosing Powassan neuroinvasive infection clinically is Powassan specific IgM antibodies in the CSF, and uh, of course a negative result for other IgM antibodies um, in the CSF. So there um, are no specific antiviral treatments approved or available for um, Powassan virus. There has been some success reported in neurologic cases with the use of intravenous steroids or immunoglobulin, or these two in combination. Um, but this is just a few studies and the data is, is quite limited um, and this is not an approved um, treatment for Powassan. So really supportive care should be administered as appropriate, as appropriate but really the, the name of the game is prevention with these um, these uh, arboviruses, including Powassan. So this means personal protective measures, um, avoiding contact with ticks, uh, wearing long clothing, um, avoiding exposed skin in, in endemic regions, um, repelling ticks with products such as DEET or permethrin, um, and finding and removing ticks as soon as possible. And this is particularly important with Powassan, with some of the other um, bacterial and parasitic pathogens, we know that the tick has to be attached um, for a, a number of hours before it transmits, but um, Powassan's quite different because it is already in the salivary gland of the tick and it can, um, has been shown to be transmitted in as little as 15 minutes um, after attachment. Um, so it's really important that, that ticks are removed as soon as possible. And um, providers may want to consider emphasizing the importance of these measures that routine, well, child, as well as adult um, annual physical exams. So getting a little bit more into these different um, lineages and the ecology of Powassan virus, um, lineage one prototype Powassan virus is vectored primarily by um, the woodchuck tick, Exodes cookii, um, and to a lesser extent by uh, the squirrel tick, Exodes marksi. Um, so the reservoirs are small burrowing mammals, in particular um, the woodchuck um, and, and woodchuck ticks um, are relatively difficult to encounter, which is um, certainly a good thing when it comes to human disease. Um, so historically, when we think most of the cases were attributed to lineage one, um, the, the disease associated with infection was much more rare given the uh, um, unlikely event of encountering a woodchuck tick. Um, but unfortunately, um, in 1995, published first in 1997, we saw the emergence of deer tick virus. 
um, or lineage two Powassan virus. And this is vectored by the black-legged tick, the deer tick, Exodes scapularis shown here. Um, the, the reservoir, the amplifying reservoir um, has been somewhat elusive. Um, it, these ticks are known to feed on a variety of hosts. Um, the white-footed mouse has been implicated as a potential important amplifying reservoir. Um, and certainly uh, a number of other mammals are, are known to be exposed. Um, and importantly, when it comes to human disease, encounters with deer ticks are, are very common and um, they're known to, um, to vector a number of human pathogens as I'll, I'll discuss um, here. So Exodes scapularis, um, not only do they um, vector a number of pathogens, but their range has been increasing and prevalence increasing over the last couple of decades. So this is a review out of Trends in Parasitology from a few years back. You can see the range of scapularis in 1996 um, and then 20 years later in 2016 um, spread throughout much of the eastern half of the U.S. And at the bottom two panels, these maps show the incidence of Lyme disease corresponding to this increase in um, prevalence and distribution of Exodes scapularis. So again, they've been shown to vector um, seven different pathogens that are responsible for human illness, um, Babesia macrotai, uh, Borrelia burgdorferi, the cause of agent of Lyme, Anaplasma, um, Powassan again um, in the late 90s, um, deer tick virus specifically, and then some of these lesser known Ehrlichia and Borrelia um, pathogens. And you can see with the rise in, in prevalence of the tick, we also see a rise again in incidence of disease. On the top here, um, you're looking at uh, Lyme disease cases and the, the smaller bars in this graph are anaplasma um, and babesia. Um, and again, we've seen the same trend even though it's to a lesser degree with Powassan virus. We've certainly seen an increase um, since 2000 in the number of diagnosed case, cases of Powassan um, in the US and I think this number for 2021 will be in this range of around 25 to 30. So um, this uh, more persistent activity of Powassan certainly um, over the last two decades and particularly um, over the last uh, five or six years. So there's important seasonality with these black-legged tick associated pathogens. They have a two year life cycle. Um, the eggs um, hatch in, in the spring and you have the, the larval stage um, in the summer. Now there has been evidence that this virus can be vertically transmitted. Um, that's transmitted um, from the adult tick um, through the eggs to the, to the next generation. Um, it's not totally clear how important that is in the maintenance of this virus, but it has been shown experimentally. And, and with our, in our lab, we've identified um, some positive larvae um, showing evidence of, of this vertical transmission. Um, so th then you have uh, adult uh, activity in the fall um, and subsequent egg laying um, in the spring. The nymphal activity is also in the spring um, following the molting from the larvae to the nymph. Importantly, the larvae and the nymph both have to take blood meals um, and in that way can pick up um, the virus from an amplifying host. Um, and the nymphal activity is particularly important. We see this with all uh, the associated pathogens with this tick. Um, because the nymphs are um, often infected and they're, they're so small that they're often missed on, on a human, um, we see the peaks in activity from these pathogens often in uh, June, July, and, and into August following the peak of nymphal activity and then some continued transmission uh, throughout the rest of the season. Um, so I'm going to focus in now a bit on activity historically in New York State, where we are. So from 1958 to 2002, um, there were only a total of 10 cases of Powassan identified, um, eight male, two female, and the demographics were quite different than we see now. So an age range of one to 82, but a median age of 10. Nine of these 10 cases were in individuals younger than 15. Um, and you can see activity here, uh, mostly in Eastern New York and upstate New York, not so much downstate. Case fatality rate was just 10%. Um, and this, is, this has gone up quite a bit recently. And this was only the, the one individual who was older in this cohort. Um, <clears throat> this is likely because 
Um, again, we attribute these historic cases to lineage one, um, which was um, is vectored primarily by Exodes cookii. And so infection um, likely occurred in these rare events where you had um, interaction of a child with a, a woodchuck or a woodchuck burrow um, and therefore exposed to an infected uh, woodchuck tick. Uh, but things changed after the emergence of deer tick virus, lineage two. Um, so you can see from 2003 to 2020, um, we, we've had 40 um, diagnosed cases and uh, the, the location of these cases is quite different now. We see the range and the darker color here corresponds to um, a higher number of cases, um, primarily, in the, primarily in the lower Hudson Valley. And this corresponds, as you'll see, to the range and uh, prevalence of, of the deer tick, Exodes scapularis. Um, the demographics have changed. The median age um, for um, case, cases um, in this cohort is 70. Um, and the majority of these we know had no history of travel, so local transmission. And the mortality rate has been higher, 36%. Um, so, and, and this is coincident I mean, with um, uh, other pathogens, um, this trend um, in, in terms of increasing uh, prevalence in these areas where we see more deer ticks. Um, the incubation time range from seven to 40 days um, for these individuals. And, and there's a high um, variability in the time to mortality for the fatal cases ranging between 13 and 240 days uh, post-symptom onset. Um, so I said I would uh, mention these subclinical infections or, or some data showing some evidence of increased um, exposure, in, particularly in these endemic regions. Um, there have been other zero surveys in other regions, and, and by and large, the take home is that there's likely, as we see with other arboviruses and other flaviviruses, um, a relatively high percentage of subclinical or, or asymptomatic infections. Um, so this was work done um, in conjunction or collaboration with other clinical labs at the Wadsworth and um, Alan Dupuy in our lab did uh, neutralizing antibody tests on individuals that um, are specimens that were submitted for testing for other tick-borne pathogens, but not Powassan virus. So presumably these are individuals who had some exposure to ticks um, and you can see in this 2013 study that was done in, um, for those of you not familiar with uh, counties in New York State, this is the lower Hudson Valley downstate region. And you can see 15 of 284 specimens here had evidence um, of Powassan neutralizing antibody. Um, so a, a relatively high level of seroprevalence, um, certainly relative to the number of diagnosed cases, neurologic cases. Um, this was done again statewide in 2017. Um, fewer um, specimens were tested here, but again, we saw a similar trend that statewide about 3% of these individuals had evidence of neutralizing antibody in a Powassan virus. And in these lower Hudson Valley region um, counties, we actually saw an increase from 2013 to 2017 where 8.3% um, had some evidence of um, antibody to Powassan. So clearly there's um, a, a number of um, inapparent or subclinical, possibly mild febrile illness-like um, disease that, that is not um, diagnosed. <clears throat> we do quite a bit of genomic sequencing, genomic surveillance in our lab um, for a number of arboviruses, including Powassan virus. And, and we've done a, a, quite a bit of sequencing recently with Powassan virus, and I'm not gonna go into um, too much of this in terms of uh, the level of detail that, that we get into here, but I do want to mention a couple things. Um, if you look at Powassan versus deer tick virus, lineage one versus lineage two, um, they're 92 to 96 percent similar on the amino acid level, um, which sounds like a lot, but those who know um, about viruses know that, that that can be quite different. That can mean in, in the 11 KB genome up to 40 um, residue differences. And even a single amino acid change can have a large phenotypic impact. So that can be um, pretty significant in terms of transmissibility, virulence, fitness. And um, they're just 85% similar on, on the nucleotide level. Um, so a level of similarity or dissimilarity that you might normally consider to be separate species. Um, but because um, both the symptomology and even more so because they're serologically indistinguishable, 
indistinguishable. We, we consider them separate lineages of, of the same virus. Um, again, there's strong support for genetic separation um, by geographic foci, and some of that's shown here. If I were to show you uh, more data, you'd see even more focal um, geographic separation. But here you see uh, New York and Atlantic Coast strains of deer tick virus um, grouping together. Um, and these Midwest strains of deer tick virus, some of these more historic strains from the Midwest uh, forming a separate clade. And then of course, a separate lineage, lineage one, these are your prototype Powassan viruses, some historic uh, human samples from New York. Um, and then you have a, a separate well-supported clade with the, these Russian um, isolates of Powassan. So um, we work in collaboration with the New York State Epi Group, the Bureau of Communicable Disease Control, um, as well as the county health departments. And, and they um, collect ticks throughout the state for surveillance testing. Um, and the way they do, is, do this is by dragging or flagging. They have a large active surveillance um, program. Um, and they do this to measure relative tick abundance, temporal and spatial variation, and entomological risk. And then um, the samples are tested for a wide um, range of pathogens, and then all the viral testing um, happens in our lab. And that includes um, QRT-PCR of uh, tick pools following processing for Powassan virus, as well as now uh, Heartland and Bourbon viruses, which I'll uh, talk about briefly at the end. Um, we also put these on vertebrate tissue culture in order to try to isolate viruses for further phenotypic characterization and for, for sequencing. And I'll show a, a little bit of data on that in a minute. But the, um, the, these efforts, these active surveillance efforts have, have allowed us to, um, to get an accurate or um, widespread um, picture of Powassan prevalence in ticks in New York State. So you can see here um, on the left, um, the prevalence of Powassan in the ticks that are collected. There have been, um, at this point, over 75,000 questing ticks from different life stages and um, collected. Um, by the, um, the county health departments and the, the Bureau of Communicable Disease Control um, and sent to us for testing. Um, this, again, excludes New York City. They, they do their own surveillance. Um, and you can see the darker colors, again, represent the higher prevalence levels. So as we would expect because of the prevalence of Exodes scapularis in downstate New York, the highest prevalence counties are, um, are downstate. And then we see this other um, foci where we are in the capital district in Eastern New York, and then some positives in central and Northern New York. Um, importantly on the right here, you see that in recent years, over the last seven years or so, we've seen um, pretty much with each passing year, a new county popping up. So the darker color here represents a more frequent first time um, or more recent first time isolate. Okay, so you can see historically a lot of activity in downstate New York. And then in recent years, we've seen much more activity in the, um, or the first uh, evidence of tick, um, uh, positive ticks for Powassan in the Capital District, and then more recently in central and northern New York. Um, <clears throat> importantly, as I said before, we also have tried to characterize some of these um, viruses, both genetically and phenotypically. And um, one really interesting story that's emerged the last couple of years is this uh, re-emergence of lineage one Powassan virus in New York State. Um, so these um, isolates that we've, um, we've attained in the last couple of years are the first isolates of lineage one in, in over 30 years in the state. Um, there are a couple of reasons for this. This doesn't necessarily mean it hasn't been circulating, um, normal active surveillance techniques don't usually pick up uh, the woodchuck tick, um, which tend to hang out in, in the burrows. So um, generally we're not testing woodchuck ticks. We did get um, some submissions from the USDA from two counties um, in, we continue to, to test those as we get them. And the two of the three uh, lineage one Powassan isolates that we were able to attain in these last couple of years did come from, from um, woodchuck ticks, but we also had a couple isolates for the first time ever from a scapularis. Um, again, this lineage one has never been seen in, in the deer tick. Um, so this was a, a really interesting finding. Um, this was in uh, Oneida County 
um, from a couple of tick pools from the area. And we did some sequencing and you can see this virus grouping with these other um, Powassan from uh, Exodes cookii and, and clearly lineage one grouping with these historic lineage one strains where deer tick virus is down here. And it has some, some pretty unique genetic changes um, relative to these other viruses that we think could be important. Um, we've also, as I said, done some phenotypic characterization. This is work done by a graduate student in our lab, uh, Rachel Lang, um, where she's looked at growth kinetics in um, Exodes scapularis following immersion of ticks um, in media that contains these different strains. Um, so she immerses the ticks in, in, the, in the viruses and then um, washes them off and then looks for virus replication um, at various days post-infection. You can see, see by this graph the, the as expected, um, sort of our typical deer tick virus um, growing quite well in um, the deer tick. And then um, uh, Powassan isolate from Exodes cookii here on the bottom, um, not um, replicating that well compared to these other viruses. And then the Powassan lineage one that was um, isolated from Exodes scapularis sort of showing you this intermediate uh, phenotype. Um, so it's quite interesting. Um, we're doing more characterization on that. And um, we don't uh, completely understand at this point what this means in terms of transmission and disease, but um, we're continuing uh, to study that. So as I said before, the, the vertebrate um, ecology um, is, is still somewhat unclear for Powassan virus. Um, and this is some work done by Alan Dupuy and, and Ryan Peters in our lab in conjunction with uh, the Cary Institute a while back, looking at um, antibody positives and, and ticks off various um, mostly small mammals and showing evidence certainly of previous infection um, and in some cases infected nymphs on um, these various potential reservoirs, um, but no virus uh, attained um, from, from the animal itself. Um, Birds are, are, are interesting. They don't support high levels of uremia, but they do clearly occasionally get infected. And that's shown by these, uh, this neutralizing antibody positive uh, result here. What they're probably most likely important for is um, dispersal of ticks. So they can have low to medium tick burdens. Um, most of these other cycles or these other reservoirs have relatively low um, or small ranges. Um, and, and so these, this activity is usually quite focal, um, but the, the uh, birds are likely important for dispersing ticks to, to, and pathogens to, to new regions. Um, there's been some, some uh, recent evidence, this new study that just came out, incriminating shrews as a potential reservoir for Powassan virus. Um, clearly they are important uh, to some extent in the amplification, um, but there's still a lot of questions on, on the host side. Um, Deer are uh, another clearly important uh, feeding host for adult ticks. Um, they don't, again, support high levels of viremia, so they're, they're not an amplifying host, but um, they're a, a great sentinel. Um, so it's something that we've used for, um, for um, surveillance. Um, they're, they have a limited host range of less than two square miles. Um, they have these huge tick burdens, so hundreds or thousands of um, ticks that they're exposed to throughout their lifetime. Um, and and we, have, um, we have availability of deer through these um, hunter processing centers um, throughout the state. And this is work that's again done by um, the Vector Ecology Lab and the, the EPI side of New York State. Um, and it's conducted during the opening week of rifle season. So, so most recently, a couple of weeks ago in New York, um, Ticks are removed and tested, and then a blood sample is taken from the abdominal cavity um, to look for antibodies um, against uh, tick-borne pathogens and, and other arboviruses. So because of that effort, we have evidence that um, Powassan, as well as a number of other arboviral pathogens, have a much more widespread geographic range than would be uh, suggested by the tick testing alone. So, so a really important um, data set that, that's highly sensitive. Um, so you can see here the number of, of deer sampled from each county. Um, there have been a total of 49 out of the 57 counties 
um, sampled um, through from 2007 to 2019. And on the right, you see the seroprevalence of Powassan in those samples. Um, so as you would expect, as we saw with the tick testing, a high seroprevalence in the lower Hudson Valley. Um, and in fact, um, just about every deer that's tested from that region has uh, evidence of neutralizing antibody to, to Powassan virus. Um, quite high in the capital district, again, sort of mimicking the, the distribution in the ticks. But we also see evidence of um, infection throughout the rest of the state. Even in Western New York, um, 14, over 14% 14 of the deer tested from there um, are, um, are seropositive to, to Powassan virus. So clearly widespread um, activity uh, throughout the state. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about clinical testing um, and then mention a couple of the other viruses in my last 10 minutes or so, but I just wanted to kind of recap the, the take home um, um, so far in this talk. So total number of human Powassan infections have tripled in New York State during the last 15 years as compared to the previous 45. Um, Powassan, especially deer tick virus, is widespread um, throughout New York State. We know that from, from the deer data. Um, but particularly in these focal regions where we have high, high um, numbers of deer ticks in the lower Hudson River Valley, um, as well as Long Island. Um, isolation um, of ticks collected from hunter killed deer suggests increased risk for hunters in New York State when adult ticks are, are still active. Um, again, especially in the, these endemic regions. Um, and then just as a general point, increased prevalence distribution and diversity of pathogens that are transmitted by these black-legged ticks demonstrates a need for clinicians to consider exposure to Powassan, um, but also numerous other um, pathogens transmitted by these ticks and the potential for co-infections, which um, happen quite frequently and, and we're seeing more and more, it seems, each year. Um, so in terms of clinical testing, just a, a generic overview of virus and antibody kinetics. Um, so again, a, a variable um, incubation period time from um, exposure to, to symptom onset, one to five weeks. And then you have approximately one week of this febrile illness. Um, and if we kind of look in the right here, and this is actually West Nile, but the, the kinetics are similar with, with, West, with uh, Powassan um, and, and uh, really other flaviviruses. Um, it's, it's quite difficult to um, diagnose a really any arbovirus infection, including Powassan with a PCR positive um, from, from viremia, from a serum sample. Um, and that's because as you can see here, symptom onset usually comes up at the tail end of viremia. Um, and, and at this point, um, if you're submitting a, a specimen for testing, uh, viremia is likely gone, but you do see that the the viral replication in the CSF for these neurologic cases does um, somewhat mimic um, symptomology. So um, as, as generally happens with any neurologic case, a CSF sample is taken and that can be a really important specimen type for um, identifying um, Powassan um, virus. Um, but generally, more often than not, as is the case with most arboviruses, these are diagnosed by serological tests, okay? so. So following um, symptoms, um, at least the febrile portion of, of symptoms, you see a rise in uh, IgM in the CSF as well as the blood, um, and you have a, an increase in, in uh, neutralizing antibody um, throughout that time as, as the uh, individual seroconverts. So the clinical testing that we do here at the Department of Health and the Wadsworth Center, um, the molecular testing of Powassan RNA, this is done at the Clinical Virology Lab uh, led by Kirsten St. George, um, who's been quite busy with, with COVID testing in recent years. Um, but this is a real-time RT-PCR test, um, same test that we use to identify um, Powassan in, in the ticks. Um, the preferred specimen types are, are CSF and, and CIRA, um, although there's, there's also some recent evidence showing that um, whole blood um, for arboviruses in general can be a, a good specimen type. You tend to have lower CT values, higher level of virus, and, and longer persistence. Um, so that can be valuable also. This assay targets the NS5 gene, 
Um, this codes for the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase and the methyl transferase. So these are highly conserved uh, regions in flaviviruses. So it detects both lineages, um, Powassan and deer tick virus, but it does not differentiate between them. Um, subsequent testing with uh, heminested PCR and DNA sequencing um, can be done to confirm and to identify the specific lineage or, or genotype that's responsible um, for an infection. Um, but again, these are um, clinical cases of POAS and are more often diagnosed by serology and the, the frontline serological test that's done here at the Diagnostic Immunology Lab led by, by Bill Lee um, at the Wadsworth Center is done using the microsphere immunoassay, Luminex assay. This is a screening assay that measures total antibody, so IgM, IgA, and um, IgG, um, to the Powassan envelope protein. Um, and it is also multiplexed with, um, with uh, both the West Nile envelope and West Nile replicase. Um, so, so both um, infections can be diagnosed with this assay and, and cross-reactivity assessed. Um, CIRA is, of course, the desired specimen for this assay. It's CLEP approved for reporting on humans residing in New York State. And for all the positive um, uh, positives that are, are attained using this assay, they're sent to our lab for plaque reduction neutralization testing um, for confirmation. So, so this is the test done here at the, the Arbovirus lab. The reason we do this test is it requires live virus. Um, and, and we're one of the only labs that can work with it. So um, this is really considered the gold standard for, for neutralizing antibody, um, greater antibody specificity, um, but it's more labor intensive and, and, and um, longer uh, wait time certainly um, than, than your, your typical um, MIA or, or ELISA assay. Um, so it requires two serum samples, serum samples an, an acute three to 10 days after symptoms and a convalescent convalescent sample ideally two to three weeks after the acute. So the neutralizing antibody titer refers to the inverse of the max dilution at which we see 90% reduction in viral plaques. So again, a sera sample is mixed with a known amount of virus. Um, you're looking at a picture of a plaque titration here. So we know the amount of virus, each individual plaque is an infectious particle. Um, we look for the um, dilution in which we see a 90% reduction in uh, the known titer, and, and this is uh, the titer of, of the clinical sample. Um, a fourfold or higher increase from acute to convalescent indicates a, a recent infection. So that's that convalescent bleed is really important for, for timing purposes. Um, and this was performed with uh, suspect and related arboviruses. So we do cross neutralizations um, for Powassan with other flaviviruses. Um, but in, importantly, there's, there's really little cross reactivity with endemic mosquito-borne viruses such as West Nile or, or St. Louis encephalitis. So a Powassan um, case is, is usually quite clear by this test. Um, one interesting side note is Powassan uh, prototype, the LB strain, your pro prototype lineage one strain, is the most highly neutralized regardless of the strain responsible for infection. So although we've, um, we assume, uh, and we know from the limited sequencing we've been able to do, that the most recent infections are a result of deer tick virus, the most recent clinical cases, um, when we do this test, we see more neutralization of this uh, prototype strain. So it's um, sort of a, a immunological a conundrum, a bit of a mystery as to, to why that is and something we're, we're looking more uh, into. Um, so in, in the last minute or so here, I just want to mention a couple other um, novel tick-borne viruses that we're seeing in, in the northeastern U.S. that, that we're paying attention to in, in New York State, um, heartland and bourbon virus. Um, these are thought to be vectored by the Lone Star tick shown here. Um, these are very distinct ticks, a bit larger than uh, the deer tick, and they have this distinct uh, marking on their scutum. Um, Amblyoma americanum is the scientific name. You can see the range is, is a bit larger um, than um, scapularis, but um, obviously an intersecting range um, with, with the region where we see the deer tick. 
um, and um, known historically as a vector of Ehrlichia, um, but um, it seems also capable of uh, vectoring these uh, viral pathogens. And we now do molecular and serological testing um, at New York State um, for these pathogens. Um, so just a quick synopsis of a, a dispatch that we recently published in Emerging Infectious Diseases. So for more details, I direct people to this uh, publication. But Heartland is a, is a Bonda virus. It's in the family Phenuviridae. So there's been some changing of the Bunia virellis uh, taxonomy in recent years. So it's a bit, uh, a bit confusing. But um, regardless, these are all negative sense RNA viruses. They're segmented. They're small, medium, and large segments. Um, Heartland was first discovered in 2009 in Missouri. There have been just over 20 human cases, and these are generally mild, um, non-fatal, non-specific febrile illnesses. Again, they are vectored, um, are thought to be vectored primarily by the Lone Star Tick. And just kind of a, a quick um, case study um, that we presented in this paper, um, in August 20, 2018, uh, Department of Health epidemiologists were notified of a Heartland uh, positive, positive for RNA from uh, a tick, uh, Lone Star Nymph, that was removed from a resident of Long Island, New York. Um, subsequently, um, based on interviews with this individual who was about 60 years old, um, they found out the tick was removed on August 8th, recalled having a, a low-grade fever and fatigue for five days um, starting uh, one week after removal of the tick, um, and these symptoms resolved, and the individual made a full um, recovery. Um, subsequently, in response to this, um, the, the EPI folks did some enhanced, as well as the county health department, I should say, did some enhanced surveillance in the region. Um, fortunately, the individual also um, was, was uh, agreed to be, to be bled, um, for uh, clinical testing, and, and we did that neutralization testing here, and um, we found antibody titers of 1 to 20, 1 to 160, and 1 to 160 for samples collected at 8, 5, and 96 days after symptom onset, um, uh, consistent with a recent infection with heartland virus. Um, because of that enhanced surveillance, um, we also um, did some increased testing of Lone Star ticks from this region. And we've actually, since that time, um, identified five positive tick pools for heartland virus. We did some full genome sequencing on a couple of these, and, and the uh, phylogenetic relationship is shown here with the New York isolates um, on the top here. Um, clearly forming a distinct clade, there, there are only a few available um, sequences um, for heartland virus, but but clearly showing a distinct clade from uh, both the original Missouri isolates from, from the two patients in Missouri, and also a tick isolate um, from Tennessee in 2013. So what this suggests is we've likely had heartland virus circulating in the Northeast for quite some time. This is not a recent introduction uh, from these regions. Uh, we just um, probably have not done adequate surveillance and testing to, to identify it. Um, bourbon virus um, it, it is a, a bit more um, or a bit less understood, I should say. It's a thagotovirus in the family Orthomyxoviridae, so a distant relative of, of flu, also negative stranded, um, uh, single stranded RNA. It's highly segmented, um, discovered in 2014 in Bourbon County, Kansas. So symptoms may include um, sort of generic febrile illness again, but also nausea and vomiting. Um, general lab findings include uh, leukopenia, thrombocytopenia, um, five documented human infections uh, with two fatalities, but notably in um, individuals that were thought to be immunocompromised. Again, it's thought to be vectored by Lone Star, although that's less straightforward with bourbon virus. Um, there is serological evidence for virus circulation in the Eastern US. Um, we do have some preliminary evidence that um, suggests this virus is in New York, yet no isolations or human disease has been reported regionally. So something we're uh, keeping an eye on. Um, 
So that's it for me, but I'd just like to acknowledge um, folks um, within our lab, the New York State Arbovirus Laboratory, particularly Alan Dupuy is our uh, resident uh, expert who runs both our clinical testing and our tick surveillance. Um, and then all the other folks in the lab who, who've helped with, with our work on Powassan. Certainly the other clinical labs at the Wadsworth Center, which do the majority of the clinical testing. Um, the, Bureau of, the Bureau of Communicable Disease Control, um, the Vector Ecology Lab led by Melissa Brzezinski, um, which uh, does all the, the tick collections um, in con conjunction with the, the health departments. Um, and the, the, again, the local health departments, particularly Suffolk County, and then some folks that have helped out with uh, both testing and sequencing. And um, if there are additional questions after today's Q&A, uh, feel free to contact um, either myself or, or Alan Dupuy from our lab. Um, and thanks for your time. Thank you very much for a great and detailed presentation. And now it is my pleasure to introduce to you doc our next speaker, Dr. Leslie Wolf. Dr. Wolf is the laboratory director and clinical assistant professor in the Division of Infectious Diseases Department of Medicine at the University of Louisville. Dr. Wolf started her career in the field of public health with an emerging infectious diseases postdoctoral fellowship at the North Carolina State Laboratory of Public Health. Since then, Dr. Wolf has served as a public health scientist assistant public health laboratory director, and finally, public health laboratory director, until moving back to Kentucky, where she is currently the laboratory director at the University of Louisville. Dr. Wolf's research is focused on better understanding tick-borne diseases in endemic and non-endemic areas. Welcome, Dr. Wolf. I will pass it over to you to begin your presentation. Thank you. Hello, um, my name is uh, Dr. Leslie Wolf, and it's my um, pleasure to be invited to participate in this educational series. Uh, and so as uh, Maite indicated, I'm going to give the perspective as, of a state um, that is not end endemic for Powassan um, and talk a little bit about the tick-borne diseases we do know about in Kentucky. So what I'll start with today is our most commonly reported tick-borne diseases in Kentucky. I'm going to share with you our laboratory data from the years of 2016 to 2021. And then finally uh, end the session by coming back to Powassan virus uh, with the question, does Kentucky have Powassan virus? So I just wanted to give you a hint about the top three uh, in Kentucky. So according to the CDC data, the last data that was posted on their website officially reported for the spotted fever group rickettsiosis, which I'll talk about, we had a combined total uh, between confirmed and probable cases of 347. For ehrlichiosis, we had um, a total of 104 cases reported in 2019. And then for Lyme disease, we had a total of 23, which is confirmed pro plus probable cases of Lyme disease. So as I said, I wanted to share our data. Um, I wanted to mention a, a few caveats to this data. Um, the first one, the uh, important one, is that we serve our um, healthcare community in our region. And so there are a few major hospital systems that we serve as a reference lab for, for tick-borne disease testing. As a reference lab, we are most of the time not privy to a lot of clinical information. We simply get the sample um, and test it and provide results. Um, and so for this data, this is simply our laboratory results. Um, we don't know if they were confirmed or probable cases or not. Um, the second thing I'll mention is that we rarely get acute and convalescent serum. So we get a single serum sample that we test and we give the best interpretation that we can, but we know this is not ideal for actually uh, laboratory diagnosis of tick-borne diseases. So um, that being said, um, I did wanna also mention that 
in 2018, we changed our uh, protocol for Lyme disease testing. In 2016 and 2017, if you'll notice on the far right uh, of this table, um, we only performed the screening, so the first step of Lyme disease serological testing. Um, at that time, we uh, thought that it was better to screen and then let the healthcare provider know that it was screened positive and they should probably send a sample for confirmatory testing. But in 2018, we decided that probably wasn't the best customer service. And so we started doing a, uh, a two-step Lyme as recommended by CDC, starting with Western blot and then switching over to the modified two-tier test for Lyme disease. So you can see that um, at least in the laboratory, um, we do have some reactivity for serum that we receive in our laboratory for uh, reactivity to Borrelia burgdorferi antigens. Uh, the next thing I wanted to point out on the slide is that uh, for Ehrlichia, we use a, a PCR detection on whole blood. We started doing this in 2016. And while our number of patients that we test fluctuates from year to year, um, for reasons I won't go into, uh, you can see that we do uh, get anywhere from uh, 19 to, to 20 cases in a, in a given year, um, with the peak being um, between May and, and September. We did for the first time detect anaplasma in a whole blood specimen in 2021, which was exciting for our laboratory. Um, and we actually did call the submitter about this because it was the first time we had detected anaplasma. Uh, and they told us that, in fact, this person had, for work purposes, been in the northeastern United States, and so it did make sense that they were positive for anaplasma. And then finally, I'll talk about our spotted fever and typhus group serology. So we use the uh, indirect immunofluorescence assay, or IFA, to look for both IgG and IgM antibodies to either antigens of rickettsia rickettsii or rickettsia typhus, or rickettsia typhi, sorry. Um, and so these are um, the results for IgG and IgM for the spotted fever group rickettsia, uh, which is what it's preferred to be called now. Um, and you can see that we have quite a bit of positivity, um, particularly in our IgG. And then occasionally we see some reactivity in the typhus group uh, rickettsial diseases, but it's a small number and um, not really common. And because serology is known to have cross-reactivity, um, we report this, but uh, rely on the doctors to kind of sort out uh, based on travel history habits uh, of the patient. So the first group of diseases I want to talk about that's common to Kentucky is spotted fever group rickettsiosis. So Rocky Mountain spotted fever is the most serious and commonly reported spotted fever group in the United States and in Kentucky. And it's caused by the pathogen rickettsia rickettsii, uh, which is not easily grown in the laboratory. Um, it's, it's more of an intracellular bacterium. Um, and so it doesn't grow on auger like other bacteria. There are some other causes of spotted fevers in the United States that are newer than Rocky Mountain spotted fever or rickettsia rickettsii. And that includes rickettsia parkeri rickettsiosis, which typically causes a milder disease. And then Pacific Coast tick fever caused by rickettsia species 364D. Um, and of course that would be more common in the Western part of the United States. So, Again, thanks to the CDC, we have um, an incidence map, the United States from 2019, again, the la latest data that um, has been published. And you can see that Kentucky, um, the state right here, where we are, um, is in the hot zone. Um, in 2019, our incidence of spotted fever group rickettsiosis was 77.7 um, .7 cases per million population. And Kentucky has a little over 4 million people um, presently. Um, so we are a high incident state for spotted fever group rickettsiosis. So unlike uh, some of the other uh, illnesses that Dr. Siota mentioned before, this uh, group of 
diseases is transmitted by the American dog tick, Dermacenter variabilis, at least in the eastern part of the United States. In the western part of the United States, it, could, it can be transmitted by a related tick species known as the Rocky Mountain wood tick or Dermacenter andersonii. Um, and then in some recent years, there have actually been um, a focal outbreak of spotted fever group rickettsiosis in the southwestern United States and Mexico. And this was found to be transmitted by the brown dog tick known as Rupicephalus sanguine sanguineus. Um, and so here's a, a picture of the um, American dog tick. Um, and you can see it's quite distinct. Um, it's a much larger tick. Um, and, and not nearly as aggressive as some of the other um, tick species that we've been talking about. So what are some signs and symptoms of a spotted fever group rickettsiosis? Well, the first sign um, is generally a dark scab known as an eschar at the site of the tick bite. They usually develop a few days to up to a week after the bite of an infected tick. Several days after this eschar develops, Patients can develop other signs and symptoms, such as fever, headache, rash, and even muscle aches. Um, and historically, the, they call it the triad of spotted fever um, is fever, headache, and rash. But it's important to note that all, not all patients are going to have all of these hallmark symptoms of Rocky Mountain spotted fever. So clinical diagnosis. Um, it's important that, again, these tick-borne diseases tend to be seasonal. Um, spring through fall. And so asking a patient with these somewhat nonspecific symptoms um, what their habits are. Do they know they've had a recent tick bite? Have they been doing something where they're exposed to tick habitats? Do they have contact with dogs or pets who, who may have the, um, the dog tick attached to them? And history of recent travel to areas of high incidence um, can be very helpful to a healthcare provider in making the initial diagnosis. There are other clinical indicators such as a low platelet count, a low serum sodium, and mild to moderately elevated levels of hepatic transaminases can also, see, also be helpful predictors of spotted fever group infection. And as I said, in the early stages of illness, the very early stages, not all of these um, signs and symptoms may be present. So in the laboratory, as I mentioned when sharing our laboratory data, uh, the reference standard is the indirect immunofluorescent assay, or IFA for short. Again, laboratory diagnosis uh, would be confirmed by documenting a fourfold or greater rise in titer between an acute and convalescent phase serum. And if acute phase specimens that might be taken in the early stages of illness within that first week um, may not have antibodies or very low levels. So that's why obtaining in a convalescent phase serum sample about two to four weeks afterwards is very helpful. Again, our laboratory does not typically get that. Um, about 85% of patients will not have detectable antibody titers during that first week. And so it's really important that clinicians um, recognize the spotted fever group um, and treat empirically without waiting for laboratory confirmation. And here um, I've borrowed a slide from the CDC to show um, generally what an IFA reaction would look like if, if a patient serum was reactive with rickettsia rickettsii or some other spotted fever group rickettsial species. Um, you'll see a nice green fluorescence pattern, which we grade as between one plus and four plus uh, fluorescence. So fortunately, uh, the treatment for many of these bacterial pathogens transmitted by ticks is doxy doxycycline. Um, and as I said, because Rocky Mountain spotted fever is the most serious of the rickettsial diseases that we know about, um, it's really uh, recommended that the physician go ahead and treat the patient um, because there are um, outcomes such as death and very severe illness. Um, if, if doxycycline is not started early enough. And of course, there are treatments for adults and children's children and recommendations for people who are allergic to doxycycline or are it's contraindicated for some reason. So the next disease I wanna talk about is ehrlichiosis. Um, 
Ehrlichiosis are, are a group of diseases caused by Ehrlichia chaffiensis, the most common one um, that we see in our state, Ehrlichia ewingi or Ehrlichia muris oclarensis, which is a, a relatively recent one and really has, to my knowledge, only been documented in um, Wisconsin, so the upper Midwest. So similar to rickettsia, these bacteria are gram-negative obligate intracellular bacteria. When ehrlichiosis um, emerged in, in the 90s as, as a emerging tick-borne infection, um, one of the ways that it could be recognized through a blood smear was the presence of morile um, in the blood smear because uh, ehrlichia likes to inflect, infect white blood cells. And so you can see these grape-like uh, clusters inside um, the white blood cells. So this picture looks similar to the one for spotted fever group. Again, this is from the CDC, um, estimating the incidence uh, per million population in states. You can see Kentucky is once again in the hot zone right here um, as the dark purple color. The, the incidence of ehrlichiosis in, in Kentucky was 22.83 cases per million population in 2019. So um, as the title would suggest, ehrlichiosis is transmitted by a tick. Um, in the United States, um, ehrlichia chaffiensis and ehrlichia ewingi are carried by the lone star tick, Amblyoma americanum. And although it was originally found primarily in the South, Central, and Eastern United States, um, it's a very aggressive, successful tick species. So it's, it's marched itself um, northward. Um, and this is in contrast to the Emurus oclarensis, which I mentioned was mainly identified in Wisconsin and the upper, mid upper Midwest of the United States. It is carried by the black-legged tick Ixodes scapularis, um, as Dr. Ciota indicated in his talk, um, that the black-legged deer tick is a vector for many um, viral and tick-borne illnesses. So I wanted to um, show maps um, because we've talked about ehrlichiosis um, and I will be talking about Lyme disease, that you can see the Lone Star Tick has, has quite um, taken over the Eastern United States. It's a very successful, aggressively feeding tick. And then the Black-Legged Tick um, has also been um, found in Kentucky and in the Southeastern United States. And you can see the difference in size between the Black-Legged Tick and the Lone Star Tick. Um, and the Lone Star Tick is also one that feeds at multiple life stages, um, and like, unlike some of the other ticks that, that are sort of picky and when they take their blood meal, these, these feed um, throughout most of their life cycles. So some of the early signs that a person might have ehrlichiosis is kind of flu-like symptoms. Fever, chills, rigors, headache, malaise, myalgia, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, or appetite. Uh, they can even be confused or have a rash. But um, the rash is different in how often it occurs in children versus adults with ehrlichiosis. So in children, um, 60 up to 60% of children can have a rash, but in adults, it's much less common. Um, and it tends to occur about five days after these symptom onset of, of fever or headache, you know, sort of flu-like symptoms. And the rash, when it does occur, is usually on the palms of your hands and the soles of your feet. Um, and the rash is, uh, is variable. So for Ehrlichia chaffiensis, the infection may cause a rash that is maculopapular or petechial, um, but it's not itchy. So if um, antibiotic treatment is delayed and, and the possibility of Ehrlichiosis being the cause of these generalized symptoms, especially in the absence of a rash, um, then later symptoms can occur that are quite severe. Meningitis, meningoencephalitis, other CNS involvement, up to about 20% of patients that can occur in. Um, there can be an acute respiratory distress syndrome that occurs, um, toxic shock or septic shock-like syndromes, renal failure, hepatic failure, and even uh, coagulopathies. So the risk factors for developing this late disease is uh, number one, delaying antibiotic treatment. Um, very young and very old people are of course at risk um, of getting severe 
uh, consequences of tick-borne illnesses, and any person that has an immune-compromising condition um, is also at risk of these um, more severe uh, symptoms and consequences of ehrlichiosis. So the clinical diagnosis is uh, a little tricky um, just because it is a nonspecific febrile illness, um, especially if people don't remember the history of a tick bite. Um, remember that some of these um, nymphs are quite small and they may not um, know that they've been bitten by one of these small ticks. Um, it is seasonal uh, when ticks are most active. Um, and of course, asking not only about a history of track tick bite, but asking about travel history or hobbies. You know, are, are you a heavy outdoors person? Do you work with um, animals um, that may have ticks? Um, and so it's also important to note that if antibiotic treatment is delayed and ehrlichiosis is not suspected by a healthcare provider, then advanced ehrlichiosis can be confused with non-tick-borne illnesses like meningoencephalitis, sepsis, um, the toxic shock or septic shock syndrome I mentioned, gastroenteritis, hepatitis, and blood malignancies. Um, and just as a quick story, um, early on when we started testing uh, patients for ehrlichiosis, uh, we actually received a specimen from a child who was at Children's Hospital uh, locally and they were concerned that this child may have leukemia or some other blood uh, blood cancer. But uh, the physicians there were astute and sent us a sample to test for ehrlichia. It was positive. And so we were able to um, provide um, assurance uh, to the family, the patient, the healthcare providers that um, the child did not, in fact, did not have uh, leukemia, but was suffering from a tick-borne illness known as ehrlichiosis. So in our laboratory, we prefer to do PCR for um, ehrlichia and anaplasma at the same time on a whole blood specimen. Um, the reference standard is still the serological test, which is an IFA assay for detecting immunoglobulin G antibodies specific to ehrlichia antigens. Um, as always, IFA assays ideally should be performed on paired acute and convalescent serum samples collected at least two to four weeks apart. So we can see that lovely fourfold rise in titers. Um, I did wanna point out that there are some IgM IFA assays available offered by other reference laboratories, but it's really not recommended um, as good practice because IgM antibodies have been shown not to really be good indicators of an acute ehrlichia infection. And of course, IgM antibodies are less specific than IgG antibodies since they are made earlier in immune response. So as I mentioned, um, treatment is with doxycycline. Presumptive treatment is recommended. And if doxycycline is started um, promptly, then it prevents those severe complications that we talked about. So finally, um, as I mentioned, Lyme disease has been reported in Kentucky. Um, Borrelia burgdorferi is a gram-negative microaerophilic spirochete. So you can see in the picture here, it looks sort of a corkscrew um, under the microscope. And just as some fun facts, um, this bacterium is unusual and then it actually has multiple copies of linear, linear chromosomes present for its genome, unlike the, the circular piece of DNA we're used to for most bacteria. Uh, this bacteria also has numerous plasmids that include genes that are usually encoded by chromosomal DNA. So these plasmids are also important to um, Borrelia burgdorferi. So you can see, unlike uh, Rocky Mountain spotted fever and ehrlichiosis, Kentucky is in the low incidence uh, part of the United States. Um, <clears throat> again, in 2019, we had um, uh, 0.3 cases um, of incidents with a total of 22 confirmed and probable cases reported to the CDC. Uh, this is just another way to look at the data. Um, for each case that was confirmed, a random dot is put. It doesn't necessarily mean it occurred in Eastern or Central Kentucky, um, but again, it just shows in a, in a different way that we are a low incident state. However, I would like to show that if, when looking at the years between 2010 and 2019 in Kentucky, um, 
there has been a general trend of increasing um, reports of Lyme disease. Um, so as I said, in, in 2019, we had 22 cases of confirmed and probable reported in Kentucky. So I won't belabor this point um, because uh, Dr. Sciotta covered this well, but Lyme disease is transmitted by the uh, black-legged tick, Ixodes scapularis. Um, what I did want to show, however, is um, this is a map that CDC compiled uh, with the help of state and local health departments to catalog the different life stages of different tick species um, present in, in the states. And so in our case, uh, documenting Ixodes scapularis species, um, if you see a red county, that means all life stages have been documented. So we do have some counties in Kentucky where all life stages of Ixodes scapularis have been detected. And then we have a few that are blue, meaning that you know, only um, one, one or two life stages have, have been identified. So we do have the tick vector here for Lyme disease. We do have a few cases reported. Again, we don't know if it's um, acquired locally or from travel because we don't have that information in our laboratory. Um, Lyme disease is probably very familiar um, to you all, so I won't um, belabor it too much. But again, it's, it's sort of flu-like symptoms, um, swollen lymph nodes. Um, and then if you're one of the 70 to 80% of infected persons, then you'll probably have the erythema migraines rash, otherwise known as a bullseye rash, that begins at the site of the tick bite um, after an average of about seven days and expands gradually over sever several days, reaching up to 12 inches or more um, across. It's not itchy or painful, but it may feel warm to the touch. Um, as it enlarges, there's a zone of clearing that creates that bullseye rash appearance. It can appear on any area of the body. Um, most pictures you see, it's on the back, but it can appear in any area of the body where the tick can bite you. And importantly, it's not always the classic erythema migraines rash. So clinical diagnosis is based on the um, bullseye rash, if it's present, plus uh, flu-like symptoms, recent tick bite or travel, or working in an endemic area where we know Lyme disease is, such as in the uh, northeastern United States or upper Midwest. So if Lyme disease is not detected early, then later stages of the disease can involve um, the nervous system causing facial palsy and nerve pain, it can involve joints causing joint pain and swelling, um, cardiac involvement such as heart palpitations. So the current recommendations for laboratory diagnosis of Lyme disease is a two-step serological assay that can detect both IgM and IgG antibodies. Uh, we are using the modified two-tier test that was FDA approved in the last few years um, because we, we found that it was a little easier to interpret and, and use than the Western blot, which was quite subjective. As with any serology, acute and convalescent serum samples are recommended. And I just included a reference for the updated recommendations for serological diagnosis of Lyme disease from the CDC that came out in 2019. Again, doxycycline is the recommended treatment for early stage Lyme disease. Um, if a person is unfortunately um, not diagnosed and moves on to later stage Lyme disease, then different antibiotics and, and longer courses of treatments are required. So um, I just wanted to show this slide, which I again borrowed from CDC, because I think it's a really nice summary of how tick-borne diseases have been increasing, not only in numbers, but in the number of discovered pathogens that cause uh, tick-borne illnesses, and, and Dr. Sciotta covered um, heartland and bourbon um, virus. So the reason um, that I joined this talk is that because Kentucky is a non-endemic state, but we have some of the um, factors that might make it possible for us to have Powassan virus circulating, um, we, we are going to embark on, on a study. So because the black-legged tick is established in some parts of Kentucky, as I showed you in the one slide, 
and Lyme disease is reported in, in people that live in Kentucky. The question is, do we have any evidence that Powassan virus might be here? So we are going to work with uh, Euroimmune and uh, New York State Department of Health um, to do a retrospective study. Um, because we have been doing tick-borne disease panel testing for so long, we have a, a nice bank of archived serum samples that uh, are positive for various tick-borne diseases in Kentucky. But we also be began saving negative uh, samples, um, samples that were not reactive but submitted for tick-borne disease testing um, for the past couple of years. Um, and then we also have serum samples that we kept that were reactive uh, in the Lyme disease serological assay. So we're going to take uh, a large number of these negative uh, serum samples and run them through the Euroimmune Powassan EIA, which is research use only, and this is a research project. And then we'll also use um, about 50 of our uh, positive uh, Lyme positive serum and, and also run that through um, the Euroimmune Powassan EIA. So that's for our, our retrospective study. What we'd like to do in the coming tick season um, is prospectively um, test uh, serum samples coming in using the, the screening tool, the Euroimmune Powassan EIA. So between our retrospective study and our prospective study, any samples that appear to be reactive in the Euroimmune Powassan EIA assay will be sent to a reference laboratory for additional testing and confirmation since we don't have that capability in our laboratory. So we're really interested and anxious to get started um, looking for this um, because we feel like if you don't look, you don't know. Um, and I just like to mention the resources I used. I, I relied again heavily on the CDC for, um, for incidence reports. And um, I would like to say that if you're interested in tick-borne diseases in the United States, um, the CDC put out a reference manual for healthcare providers, but it's also very useful for uh, laboratorians, public health folks, um, to really get a deeper understanding of what's happening with tick-borne diseases in the United States. It's, it's a really nice manual. Um, and of course, I, I'd like to uh, acknowledge our laboratory who does the diagnostic testing and, and stores the specimens so that we can participate in interesting studies like the one we're going to embark on with Powassan virus. So thank you very much for your time and attention and for the invitation to speak. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Wolf, for that presentation. And so uh, we will now move on to our question and answer panel. And so we've received a handful of questions, uh, both in the chat box and via email. And feel free uh, to continue to type in any questions that you have uh, in the chat uh, while we uh, do this panel. So um, any questions we do not get to live, uh, we will send out to our speakers and they will be uh, answered via email in the coming weeks. So let's get started. Uh, so this first question uh, could be answered by both speakers. Uh, are you, either of you, aware of any companies that are working on a vaccine to protect against Powassan virus? And uh, if a vaccine uh, were manufactured, uh, how would that virus be targeted? Any ideas, any thoughts? Um, so there are certainly research laboratories that um, are investigating different strategies for um, a Powassan virus vaccine, but um, just given the low prevalence, it's not something that's currently a attractive to a private company. Mm -hmm. um, there is, of course, a approved uh, tick-borne encephalitis virus vaccine. Um, and there has been some research to see if there's cross-reactivity there. And to the best of my knowledge, that vaccine was found to not be uh, effective against, against Powassan virus. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Dr. Ciota, next question is for you. Uh, why do you believe that the total number of Powassan infections have tripled? So is this solely due to increased reporting? Uh, definitely not. I mean, I, I, certainly with the, um, the West Nile outbreak in, in 2000, um, there, there has been increased testing um, for arboviruses in general in our region, but 
um, that can't account um, for the, the differences we see. I think it's pretty clearly, um, particularly because we see it mimic these other um, pathogens that that are um, vectored by the black-legged tick. I think it's pretty clearly an increase um, prevalence and distribution of of the black-legged tick that that's primarily driving this increased incidence. Um, there is overall likely um, more reporting, but um, I think it, it's uh, a true increase. Thank you. Uh, so the next question is for either Dr. Wolf or Dr. Ciota. Uh, what impact will the recent tornado outbreak have on spreading the vector range? Any thoughts on this? Um, I'll, this would just be an educated guess. <laughs> um, because we're sort of out of tick season, um, I mean, we know they overwinter, but they're not like active at this point. Um, I guess it remains to be seen what, what can happen in the spring when they reemerge, but um, I wouldn't anticipate that it would have um, a huge impact, but um, that's just me guessing because I'm not a vector ecologist. So if Dr. Ciota has other ideas, I'd be happy to hear them. Um, no, I, yeah, that, that's tough. I mean, I, I'm also not really an expert on tick ecology, but I, um, and certainly even, even experts would, I think, have trouble with that one because um, it's, it's complex. I mean, given especially, you think about these two-year life cycles with the scapularis, so you have to think about the impact of the current um, climactic con conditions on, you know, subsequent life stages. Um, there, there are definitely impacts of climate that have been shown, temperature, humidity, uh, and certainly you can think about habitat destruction and if there's any changes in the distribution of the hosts um, that they're feeding on as a result of these extreme weather patterns, and that could have big impacts on um, uh, on populations in, in subsequent years, but um, we'll have to wait and see. Yep. Okay, uh, next question, Dr. Ciota. Um, someone asks what's necessary for the plaque reduction neutralization test. Could you explain that a little bit um, in more detail, uh, like what is involved in, in the PRNT and is this test specific for different viruses? Um, sure, yes, it is highly specific and that's one of the primary reasons we do it. Um, so it, it's, it's a relatively low tech um, test, um, all you need is, is a known amount of virus as your input, um, which is why since we have a, a virus lab here and a BSL-3 lab, we're able to do that test here. So you have to actually mix a serum sample um, with a known amount of virus. Um, and then you also need a cell line that can um, support viral um, replication and, and form um, viral plaques. Um, for Powassan virus, we use um, BHK, BHK cells, maybe hamster kidney cells. Um, so you need those two things and then you need to be able to visualize those plaques. Um, so basically you're incubating the virus with the serum at different dilutions. Um, you're inoculating those cells um, with those mixtures as well as a control with a known amount of virus. And then um, at a few days post-infection, you're staining those cells to quantify the number of viral plaques that are formed and then comparing the, the control um, to the, the um, samples that are mixed with the sera to see how much neutralization is, is found, mm -hmm. a decrease in the number of plaques. Yep, thank you for that. Uh, now next, Dr. Wolf, uh, it was asked, in addition to Powassan virus, are you thinking to test for other tick-borne diseases which are not endemic uh, in Kentucky. Yes, uh, we wanted to start with heart. Uh, sorry, we wanted to start with Powassan because uh, Euroimmune is a company we've worked with, and they had the research use only um, assay available. But certainly on our radar is the Heartland virus. Uh, uh, Missouri is our neighbor, um, and uh, Bourbon virus. Uh, Kansas is a little further away, but. You know, Kentucky being the bourbon state, we kind of feel like we should claim some bourbon virus. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, but yeah, those are definitely two on our radar um, that we're interested in, in looking at. Awesome, thank you. Now for uh, both speakers, 
Uh, have you observed any common co-infections in ticks uh, with Powassan virus? Uh, Dr. Wolf, are you seeing any co-infections in Kentucky? Um, well, we haven't started looking for Powassan yet. That's sort of what we plan to do in the, in the coming year. Um, but I will say, uh, with regard to our other tick-borne diseases that we do test for in our, our lab, uh, we do see with some frequency some reactivity. Um, it, for example, occasionally if someone is Ehrlichia positive, uh, for some reason our Lyme assay will show some reactivity. Um, so, so we do see some, we know serology is, is not uh, perfect, but we do see some uh, common reactions when we, when we have um, a strong positive in one of our uh, panel results. And on our side, I mean, uh, with, with ticks, the short answer is absolutely yes. Um, um, you know, particularly Exodes scapularis, you think about the number of pathogens that um, this tick vectors and the, the extremely high prevalence of Borrelia, um, the cause of invasion of Lyme. So because of those, we often see co-infections. In fact, there've been instances with individual ticks um, infected with um, at least four different pathogens. Um, so, so it's very common. I mean, Borrelia can be found in some places, you know, in, in 40 or 50 percent of ticks in, in focal regions. And um, Powassan is also quite focal. Obviously, the prevalence isn't that high, um, but you know, certainly because of those numbers, we certainly often see co-infection, and of course, with other uh, agents too. So it's common. Thank you both. Uh, next, uh, Dr. Ciota. Uh, which detection method is preferred for the diagnosis of Powassan virus? So either RT-PCR or ELISA, what's sort of preferred? And could you speak about some pros and cons? Well, it, it really just depends on the timing of the specimen. I mean, um, as I said during my talk, I think, the, I mean, the preferred test generally is either the ELISA or some other serological test because um, it, it's quite uncommon um, to have a sample collected um, during that viremic phase. I mean, somebody with symptoms goes into the doctor, the doctor orders a test at that point. Generally, um, you're no longer in the viremic phase and you may, um, if it's neurologic, have virus in the CSF, but um, the, because of that timing, the preferred testing is really um, a serological test. Mm -hmm. To just follow up on, on, on this topic of testing, uh, Dr. Ciota, have you seen any differences in the neutralization tests between Powassan virus and deer tick virus? Yeah, that's a really, um, yes is the answer, but it's not as you would expect. And I, I tried to briefly touch on that, but I didn't go in, into the, the data really. We, we do see, um, they're not serologically distinguishable even by that test. In fact, as I briefly mentioned, it seems that even deer tick, in deer tick um, infections, sera from deer tick infected individuals, um, more uh, is more neutralizing to lineage one, um, mm -hmm. despite the fact that the, and, and we've confirmed this with some experimental infections in birds actually. So you don't always see the highest neutralizing antibody against the virus strain um, that the host is infected with. And uh, we don't completely understand why, um, but that makes it very difficult to try to um, get any information about lineage from a serological test. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And, and now that we have a, just about a minute left, I would like to ask just a final question. Um, and this question could be answered by both speakers. Uh, how do you envision the future of testing for Powassan virus infection in routine clinical labs? you could just comment on that as a final. Um, I mean, I think in general that the tests exist um, and, you know, it's just a matter of not just with Powassan and Dr. Wolf can comment on this, but um, all the tick-borne pathogens, um, that we need the testing to be more widely available um, um, in more settings. And um, I think they're becoming more accessible to smaller labs as they're becoming less expensive, so the tests are out there. It's just a matter of people being aware and starting to incorporate this, these tests more. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think it's um, more about raising awareness um, 
you know, we know tick-borne diseases because some of them are mild, you know, it's underreported and we only know about the more serious illnesses. Um, so I think uh, for us in Kentucky, it, it's really about gathering data for these emerging pathogens and trying to, again, um, people seem to be more interested in tick-borne diseases when there's something new and exciting to, to think about. Um, and so if we can get some data that, that says it is something we need to be concerned about, um, or, or maybe it's gonna be heartland virus that we need to be concerned about. Um, you know, I think educating our providers in our region is, is a really important step and then letting them know where the testing is available. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you all uh, for attending this webinar. Uh, we're gonna close out here and thank you again to our speakers. If anybody in the audience is interested in receiving PACE credits for this webinar, you can click the link in the chat and it will also be sent to your email. Um, and also keep an eye out for our future webinars. So our next webinar series on nephrology is starting on February 17th, and we hope to see you all there. Thank you again and have a great day. Thank you, take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.